This week's parsha, this parsha is B'Shalach, and uh, of course it tells the story of the Kriyas Yamsuf and the Oz Yashir, the Shira Siyam, the song that was sung by the Bnei Yisroel. I'd like to speak a little bit about the Kriyas Yamsuf, a little bit about the Oz Yashir. The story is a little bit odd, to point out in the past. Paro and Egypt has suffered 10 plagues. And under duress, Paro agrees to release the Jews. And Paro was told that the Jews have fled. So what does this mean he had to be told? He wasn't aware that the Jews had left. Rashi explains that Paro, until the very end, thought that the Jews were just going for three days. Because if you remember, throughout the negotiations, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's always Moshe Rabbeinu who's saying, listen, we want to go for three days, then we're going to come back. And uh, I'll just mention a very, very interesting thing about that. You know, everyone wonders, it was, seems to be deception on the part of Moshe Rabbeinu. Mm -hmm. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, listen, make a small concession. Let us go for three days, and we're going to come back. And, uh, you know, power is unwilling to do that. But isn't it a form of Gneva's das, of deception, that Moshe Rabbeinu, on the pretense of going away for three days, leads the people away? Isn't just trying to save a life? Well, that's true. But uh, you'd think that Moshe Rabbeinu should be above board. You're right. There would have been a justification for lying, yeah. a legal justification. But still, it, it is odd that Moshe Rabbeinu should present the case not as it was. We point out in the past, the reality is the exact opposite. From Paro's perspective, the Jews going for three days and coming back was much worse. If the Jews would have told Paro, if Moshe would have told Paro, listen, so we're planning on leaving, let us go forever, Paro would have been more agreeable to that. Going three days was the worst thing. Well, how so? Because go back to the original enslavement of the Jews. Because why did Paro, the original Paro, decided to enslave the Jews. The Jews were becoming very, very populous. And he was scared that uh, if there'd be a rebellion, they would side with their enemies, and they would drive us out of the land. So if anything, Paro should be overjoyed that the Jews should uh, leave. If the Jews would say, listen, we're going back home to Israel, goodbye. So Paro would say, okay, good, no problem. The whole problem is that they're here, and they're going to side with their enemies. If they're willing to leave, you know, Baruch atah b'vayecha, Baruch atah b'tseisecha. Blessed are you when you came, and blessed are you when you left. <laughs> Problem solved. Instead, Moshe Rabbeinu says, no, we're not leaving. He says, we're taking a little vacation. <laughs> That's the worst thing, you see, because from power's perspective, the only way he can suppress the Jews is by enslaving them. If instead the Jews are beginning to call the shots themselves, that they're dictating the terms of their employment to Paro, that we're going to work when we want to work, and we don't want to work, we're taking a vacation, and you're not going to be able to do anything about it, this is the worst thing. Now Paro has people who are living in Egypt, who are meant to be slaves. Instead, they are deciding when and how long they'll work. That's the worst thing from Paro's perspective. In reality, Moshe Bain was asking Paro to make a major, major, major concession. So the question really is, so when Paro heard that the Jews were running away, he should have been overjoyed. In other words, you get the exact opposite impression that Paro, okay, let him go for three days, fine. But now that they're running away forever, now we have to pursue them. To the contrary, <laughs> why should Paro want to pursue them if they're going to leave? Who's going to hate? So Rashi is bothered by this question. And Rashi says the reason Paro was chasing after the Jews was because of the money, because of the gold and silver they took. In other words, as far as the Jews, if the Jews would go, good riddance. But they took all the wealth of Mitzrayim with them, the gold, the silver, the clothing, everything. And that's what Paro had to retrieve at all costs. That's how Rashi understands. Even though if you read the Pesukim, we don't get that impression. The simple impression you get from the Psukim is that Paro is trying to retrieve them as slaves. We'll perhaps explain that. 
but uh, Rashi says that Pyro was really interested in the money. That was the issue. Why was that money so important? And why was the gold and silver such a critical issue? Pyro was willing to let them go, but not to take the money with them. So there's a medrash which says the following. This is a mushal, a parable that explains the entire story. It says there once was a Magadal Chazirim. There was a person who raised swine. And he had a neighbor who had a sheep. And one day the Magad al Chazirim wanted to serve lamb chops <laughs> to his guests. He didn't want to serve one of his swine. So he stole the sheep. Now the owner of the sheep was a very, very calm, cool fellow. So uh, he wasn't easily rattled. He goes over to the Magad al Chazirim and he says, Give me back my sheep. So the Magad al Chazirim denies it. He says, I never stole your sheep. I don't know anything about your sheep. So the uh, owner of the sheep says, fine, okay. Doesn't put up a fight, but he makes some subtle inquiries. And he asks, the neighbors tell me, where does he water his swine? Like what well, what spring? So they tell him, so in such place. And he goes and he poisons the well. Mm. And then after poisoning the well, he comes to the Magad Chazir and says, give him back my sheep. And he says, I don't have your sheep. I didn't steal your sheep. I don't know anything about it. So, great. Doesn't a fuss. Makes some more subtle inquiries. He asks, where does he graze his sheep? So, uh, swine, people tell them, a swine rather. Mm. A sudden such place. So he burns down the entire pasture. <laughs> and he comes and says, uh, let me have my sheep. I don't have your sheep. Okay. He goes around and asks, where does he send his kids to school? Ooh. He kidnaps the, the child. Oh, it is like a and then he comes and says, where's my sheep? I don't have your sheep. So he takes him prisoner. And it says in the Medrash, now the Magad al Chazirim and his son are together in a cell. And he comes and says, where's my sheep? So he confesses, I stole the sheep. You can have your sheep back. Excuse me. I shouldn't say that. He says, you can have, uh, here's your sheep. I'll give you the sheep. So the man says, that's not good enough. He says, I want all the shearings and all the offspring that the sheep uh, gave birth to while it was in your possession. So the Magad al-Hazirim says that if I have to do that, you can kill me. I'd rather die than give you back the shearings and the children of the sheep. So the measure says that this is a muscle for the story. The Magad al Chazirim obviously is Paro. The sheep is the Bnei Yisrael. The owner of the sheep is the Ribbon Shlailam. And uh, this story really corresponds to the story of the Bnei Yisrael, that uh, God did all sorts of things to Paro. Paro relents and lets the Jews go, but he won't give back the shearings, which means he won't give back the gold. You won't let the Jews take the gold, yeah. the silver, etc. Okay, what is the, the point of the Medrash? What, what is emerging from the story? And the point of the story is like this. You see, there's no shame in the Magad al-Khazir giving back the sheep. He can say face, and he can say the sheep really was mine. But listen, <laughs> how much of a fight do I have to put up? If he wants to extort the sheep from me, Okay, so be it. He can have the sheep. After poisoning the well and burning down the pasture, kidnapping my child and kidnapping me, is okay. That's, giving a sheep is a small price to pay for uh, relief from this type of uh, torture. But if I'm going to have to give him back the shearings and the offspring, that is a admission that I stole the sheep and my possession of the sheep was unjustified. That I'm not willing to do. I don't want to confess to a crime. He says, I'd rather be killed than do that. But hasn't he confessed by giving them back the sheep? No, Why? because he's saying like this. If I come to you with a gun and say, give me uh, your purse, yeah. right? That isn't an admission on your part that you stole the purse from me. Right? I'm threatening you, so you give me the purse. Right. But here, if he's going to be forced to give back the shearings in the meantime, 
as if to say, you had no right to possess the sheep, therefore the sheep rings are also mine. That's an admission of uh, guilt that that is not willing to do. So that's the issue over here. You know, the Gemara says in Parakalek that what was the idea of this gold and silver? The Jews took the gold and silver, what was it? So the Gemara tells a story that hundreds of years later, the Egyptians took the Jews to litigation in front of Alexander the Great. And they said that the Jews stole all the wealth of Mitzrayim, all the gold, all the silver. So Alexander the Great said, uh, give a defense. So there was a Jew, it was Gavir Rapsi, so he gave a defense. What was the defense? He said that this was the scarpula, these were the wages that the Jews were owed for their labor. They were slaves, they were unjustly enslaved, therefore they have to be paid for their work. And uh, these are the, uh, the wages. I think we spoke out the, the very beautiful Meshul that uh, explains that really the Jews were slaves to Paro. So Paro owed them wages. So how could they collect wages from the Jews, from the Egyptians, the, the citizens of Mitzrayim? They didn't owe the money. They were Paro's employees. You can't collect your wages from your next door neighbor. If Paro owes you the money. But the Meshachim explains, we know in earlier Egyptian history, when Yosef administered the food program in Mitzrayim, and nobody had uh, money to pay. After the first year, the money was exhausted, the livestock was exhausted. And they said, all we have left is our land and our persons. So Yosef said, fine. <laughs> we you know, take that. Uh, surrender your land, surrender your freedom, and uh, you'll have food. So it turns out that Paro acquired the entire Egyptian nation as servants. And we have a rule, Mashakana Evid Kanarabba, that which an Evid takes possession of really belongs to the master. So really all the wealth of its time, all the gold and silver that was held by private citizens, really belonged to Paro. <laughs> so therefore, if Paro has a debt, it's collectible from those assets. So when the Bnei Yisrael took the gold and silver from their neighbors, that was a legally valid collection of Pyro's debt. Beautiful. So this is what the Gemara says. This is what it was. So Pyro is like this. Okay, the Jews want to be liberated. So they poison the water, that's the Makov Dam, and Sfardei Akinim, and uh, I guess burning down the pasture corresponds to the Makos of Borod and, and Arba, and uh, they, they utterly destroy Mitzrayim. If we let the Jews go, it doesn't prove anything. It doesn't mean anything. Listen, we're not saying that we were guilty for having enslaved them, but uh, there's a point that, that we just have to surrender. We can't continue fighting a stronger power. But the Jews say, no, it's not enough. It's not enough that you let us go. You have to admit that you had no right to enslave us in the first place. And therefore, you have to pay us for our labor. That pirate says, I'm not willing to do. Says, I'm willing to lay my life in the line rather than to admit that I am guilty of injustice here. And therefore, Pyro said, at all costs, we have to retrieve the money. If the Jews would have left just you know, with the shirts on their backs, that would have been fine. I wouldn't have bothered because my letting them go is not an admission of guilt. But if I'm letting them take all the wealth of Mitzrayim, that I'm not willing to do. That isn't the admission that we had no right to enslave them. That I have to, at all costs, prevent. And it could be that what Power really was saying is like this, that if it's a package deal, if their freedom is bound with the Ruchus Godel, with the money, then the only choice they have is to enslave them again. And that's what he meant when he said, what is this kishilachnu as yishome of Dana? What is this that we we let them go free? We have to enslave them again. Not because power really needs them as slaves. Power is better off without the Jews. But if the alternative is losing the wealth, which is the admission of guilt, then power says, I'd rather risk my life and reattempt to enslave them again. That really is the uh, the issue. And this is why Paro must chase after the Jews. Of course, the idea again is that this is the final judgment against Mitzrayim. And we've brought evidence from the Psukim and at least from some Midrashim that the Eser Makas went after the purpose of punishment. The Eser Makas was a demonstration. This was God showing who's boss, his superior power. The real punishment of Mitzrayim takes place at the Yamsuf. There is the element of Mita Kineg Mita, the measure for measure, because the greatest crime of the Egyptians was the drowning of the Jewish babies 
now Paro and his army are going to be drowned. So therefore, this is really the punishment. This is really the conclusion of the story. And by the way, and this is probably why the Shira is only said at this point. When the Jews sing their song of, of uh, Thanksgiving, only at the end of the uh, Kriya Samsov, not when they left Mitzrayim. I, at first glance, you have to understand. In hindsight, we know that Pyro was going to pursue them. So one might argue, well, that's why they didn't say Shira as soon as they left Mitzrayim, because they knew their liberation wasn't complete, because they knew Pyro was going to pursue them. But they didn't know that. But we know that, because we know the end of the story. But as the Jews left Mitzrayim, did they think Pyro was going to pursue? Highly unlikely. If Pyro let them go because of the ferocity of the Makas Bukhiris, it's not likely that they would have assumed Pyro was going to change his mind in three days and come chasing after them. So why didn't they say Shira right away? And the answer is because the, the Shira really comes not so much for the liberation, but when the final judgment is exacted, that's when the Jews are inspired to say Shira. Yes? <coughs> If Paro is chasing them because of the well, it seems to me he would have done it much earlier. He waited until he thought they were lost. That seems to be what triggers his his desire to chase them, that they seem to be wandering around. No, 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 no. Because again, Paro initially thinks they're coming back. So they borrowed the gold and silver temporarily. They need you know, these things to do whatever they're doing to serve God for three days. But Paro assumes they're coming back, no problem. It's only after three days he understands that they're leaving, and therefore they're borrowing the gold and silver was a pretense. But haven't they doubled back? Like, didn't they make a left turn and then come back the other way at that point? No, no, no. That, 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 there's a different question, right? There's two issues. There's the issue of desirability and the issue of feasibility. In other words, first the question is, why does Pyro want to pursue them? The answer is because he was told that they ran away, that they're not coming back. Next question is, why does Pyro think he's going to be able to pursue them? Because after all that that God has did with the ten plagues, why does Pyro think he has a chance of success here? The answer is because the Jews apparently have reached a barrier which they can't cross. They turn back because Sagar Aleyam Amidbar, because the desert has locked them out. Right. Now this is why Pyro thinks it's, it's feasible. <clears throat> There's two different issues. There's the issue of why is it desirable? Why is this something Pyro wants to do? Well, the answer for that is because he now knows the Jews aren't coming back. The question is, why does he think he's going to be more successful than he was over the last year? The answer is because he sees that the Jews have reached a point where they are helpless. That's when they go backwards and forwards. And they're, 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 right. they're, they're, they're retreating because they can't break that barrier into the desert. So therefore, Pyro thinks, I have them where, exactly where I want them. Of course, he doesn't realize that really this is part of the trap. Yeah. Right. Wow. There's another interesting thing I'll just mention, just since you, you raised this, the, the Ran in Adrasha asks a very, very interesting question, that when the sea split and the Jews are crossing, Paro pursues them, and what did Paro think? <laughs> I mean, you walk into the uh, split ocean, obviously it's miraculous. And the miracle, presumably, was performed for the Jews. And why did Pyro think he would come out alive? You know, especially the way it's described in the Midrashim. You know, did I ever tell you I slept through Kriya Samsov? I beg your pardon? I slept through Kriya Samsov. I, went, I lived in California, so on the Universal <laughs> Studios tour, uh, they take you to the splitting yeah, of the Red Sea. And uh, you know, I had seen it so many times. I took my parents, parents who visiting, we lived in California, and uh, you know, we're on the, the trolley, and it takes you through. The, I just fell asleep. I was so <laughs> bored. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I slept the Greatest Hamsel. <laughs> you know, I missed it. Yeah, it's very interesting. I remember. This, How this about Martin Tower? Yeah. Yeah. No, not that. Uh, you know, this is only with the sheer, but I remember that uh, on that tour, they were they were showing the various places. You know. And uh, they, they showed like a facade of a house. And they said, this is where Gone with the Wind was filmed. Mm -hmm. And they heard a gasp. Someone said, oh. <laughs> imagine, like this is the holy ground. <laughs> it was filmed because a gasp of, of you know, 
person was incredulous. It was like, uh, you know, you'd go there, it's a show, and they would tell you, this is where Avram Avinu walked. You know, you would gasp. <laughs> <laughs> it was incredible. But in any case, the Ran in the Drasha says an amazing, amazing thing. He says that the Kriyas Yamsuf appeared to be a natural phenomenon. Huh? Now, this is counter to the Midrashim. A natural phenomenon? It appeared to be a natural phenomenon. Well, this is just like all the uh, so-called heretics who poo-poo miracles and say, no, it wasn't a miracle, <laughs> there's a place, it's shallow, the wind blows, and uh, uh, all the things that we say a uh, likely story. But the round says exactly that. It was exactly like that. It was a, a purely natural phenomenon. It was a place where the sea apparently was shallow, and uh, the wind would blow and it would part the waters. And uh, Pyro assumed that the same way that the, the Jews are able to walk in, we'll walk in. And then he discovered that wasn't the case. But it's an amazing thing that he says if it was. So obviously miraculous, power would have been out of his mind to walk in. It's a very, very, very interesting thing. It says the wind blew all night, right? Yeah. The power observed it. it. Is, th that probably was not so unusual. Yeah. The wind should blow. But he thought the area was the, the shallow he, area. He, he thought it was safe. He thought it was safe. Because he goes in there, they, they, they the whole levels of different drowning, like three stones, two stones, and yeah. rock. Yeah. But it ends up being incredibly deep. It's not shallow. <laughs> yeah. It, it's hard to understand how, how the round yeah. burns the psukim. I mean, if it really was that shallow, even after the waters were restored, it's hard to imagine that uh, hmm. you, know, you can't drown in uh, you know, two inches of water. I mean, you can, in theory, but it's not likely that, that you know, yeah. armies, horses, everything would tumble. Because it says, remember... It yeah, but says, Ron says that it was, it was apparently um, visible. Oh. You know, the, 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 it was seen as a non-miraculous event. It's a very, very, very strange thing. But Ron says this. Okay, so the Jews uh, did experienced... Did the Jews see it that way, too? Or is it just the Egyptians? <laughs> That's a good yeah, question. This is, is the, the question, you know. Uh, I, the, the round seems to be making a comment about the nature of the miracle, not that Pyro was blinded or, or there was a mirage or he saw it not as it was. And the round seems to say this is the way it really was. It, it, it really was something which appeared to be non miraculous. So, it's the, incredible so the miracle was the timing by the round. No, it clearly was a miracle. No, but, but I'm but saying the round's understanding has to be. That the timing is what was miraculous. Yeah, well, certainly the, there was an element of yeah, it was just at the right place at the right time. Or God but, but, but it is a, it is, it is something that uh, it goes counter to everything we assume about Kriyas Yamsa. In any case, the Jews finally uh, cross, and the Egyptians are are um, drowned, and after this they sing the Az Yashir, they sing the the Shira Sayam. Now, it's a very interesting thing. We recite the Shira Siyam daily in our prayers. It's a part of the Pesukit The tour brings that this was a Takana of the Ga'inim. That the Ga'inim, who lived after the uh, Talmud was completed, made a Takana, they made an ordinance that the Oz should be recited daily. Why? What was the basis for this? Because we know that in the Bracha, which concludes Pesuk the Zimra, the Yishtabach, we have 15 different expressions of thanksgiving. Ki l'cha no'a Hashem elokeinu v'lokeinu v'lokeinu because to you it is fitting. Shir u'shvacha halel v'zimra ozo memshola nasa k'dula g'vura t'ila v'seferes k'dusha l'malchus bracha s'vodahus. There are 15 expressions of praise and those 15 expressions are all found in the Oz Yashir. They're derived from Oz Yashir. And therefore, as an introduction to Yishtabach, it was uh, considered to be a fitting thing. So the Gaona made a Takana, made an ordinance that would be said every day. The problem is this. Now, there's a very interesting Gemara Masech Shabbos that uh, brings a statement from Rabbi Yosei. Rabbi Yosei says, Yehi chelki may omre halo b'chol yoyim. My lot in the world to come should be among those who recite the Hallel every day. 
because he considered it a very praiseworthy practice to recite the howl every day. So, halavai, my lot in heaven should be among those people. So the Quran asks the question, is that true? It says in another source that if a person says halal b'chol yayim, if he says howl every day, harezim machari fumagate, if that person is guilty of blasphemy, if you say the howl every day. So is it praiseworthy? Is it something that you should want your lot to be among those? Or is it uh, blasphemy? So the Gemara says no, no contradiction. This that it says that it's commendable isn't referring to what we call hal, it's referring to what we call psuke de zimra. The daily sounds that we say in davening. That is uh, appropriate, we said every day, and therefore that's what Rabbi Yosef was referring to when he said that my lot in the world to come should be among those who say halal every day. That means psuke de zimra. But the halal that we say on Yontif, if a person would say that every day, he's a macharif from a god, if he's guilty of a blasphemy. So the question is, what's the difference? What is the difference between the psalms that are the daily psukah de zimra and those special psalms that we recite for help? So Rabbi Niona, not there in Masech Shabbos, but in the fifth paragraph of Masech Hashabbos, it explains like this, that if you contrast, compare and contrast, the psukah de zimra to the halal that we say on Yontif, you see there's a very basic difference. The Pesuk of the Zimra praise God for his ongoing maintenance of the world. He uh, continues to conduct the world in accordance with the laws of nature. He supplies sustenance to every living being. That's what the Pesuk of the Zimra prays. The hallow praises God for his miraculous interventions in the course of history. And it's interesting to note that the Gemara in Psachim asks the question, who composed those chapters of, of Hallel? Now, we always assume that David Melch wrote the entire Sefer Tillam. But the Gemara says that really David Melch didn't write it himself. David Melch compiled it. But many of the chapters are written by other people. And what's interesting is that some of the chapters were written by people who lived after David, which is really interesting. That means that... that uh, they really composed them, and David had Ruach HaKadosh, and he foresaw what they were going to compose in the future, yeah. and he incorporated into the Telem even before they said it. I mean, it's like a, <laughs> like a time travel dilemma. That's what the Gemara says. The Gemara says that even though David compiled the Telem, some of the Kapitlach were based on later historical events. Just to give one example, which is uh, you know, the most noteworthy example, there's a psalm al Naharas Bava that talks about how the Jews lamented Yerushalayim by the rivers of Babylon. So that clearly could only have been written after the Jews were exiled to Bava with the destruction of the first base of Megdash. David HaMelech lived before the first base of Megdash was built. Uh -oh. So if David HaMelech compiled the entire Tilim, how did that para get in there? It means he foresaw it, but it really was composed by the people much later. Now, the question is that when they opened their tillum, <laughs> why didn't they find, you know? Yeah, why didn't they? They found the blank they, page. Maybe they did. <laughs> maybe they just said, oh, this is a, not appropriate uh, to Hillam to say it. Maybe, 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 maybe David Malach composed it for them to say in bubble. But the Gemara says like this, that this, these psalms, there's a question when they were composed. Some say they were composed by Moshe Rabbeinu. Some say they were composed by Yoshua when he waged war against the kings in Canaan. Some say it was composed by Devorah and Barak in their victorious wars. Some say it was composed by Hanan and Mishal of Azariah, who were spared from the fiery furnace in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. So there are various opinions. But all the opinions agree that these sounds were composed uh, in response to a divine intervention in history, a miracle. A miraculous intervention. So Ben Yonah says there's a big difference. You see, when we praise God for the great miracles, that conveys the false impression that uh, God's involvement in the world is only evident when he does great acts of salvation, miraculous acts of salvation. And uh, these are generally exceptional occasions. When God uh, runs the world on a daily basis, uh, that's not really God running the world, that's nature. The difference is from God, it's blasphemy. Because if you only 
focus on the occasional miracle is as if you're saying that the ongoing hanhaga, the ongoing uh, running of the world, is not a function of divine involvement. And that's blasphemous. Pesukah Nezimra is the contrary. Pesukah Nezimra talks about how God's running of the world, day in, day out, is really based on divine decree. And therefore, it's a wonderful thing. And Rabbi Yossi said that halavai, my portion in the world to come, should be one of those say hal on a daily basis. But it comes out from Rabbi Yonah, this distinction, that when do we praise God? We praise God on a daily basis for the natural things. The miraculous interventions we save for their anniversaries. So when Hanukkah comes, we praise God for the miracle of Hanukkah. Pesach comes for the Yitzhiyas Mitzvahim, and so on and so forth. But we don't do that on a regular, daily basis. And the question is, so Oz Yashir seems to be a violation of that principle. Oz Yashir is a song of praise that was composed for a historical miracle. So how could the Ga'inim, or why would the Ga'inim make an ordinance that should be recited on a daily basis? This should be a violation of that principle, Mechara from the God of the same reason we don't say the entire hallow, the regular hallow of Yontif on a daily basis. We shouldn't say those Yashir on a daily basis. We should save it just for the anniversary of Kriyas Yamsa, for the seventh day of Pesach, we'll say. We shouldn't say it on a daily basis. That's a Mechara from God. That's blasphemy because you're focusing not on God's ongoing care for the world, but rather on the unusual, miraculous intervention. So I'd like to make a, an observation about the Oz It's an amazing thing. If you, if you look in the Oz you, you see a very, very odd thing, that the miracle that is praised in the Oz is not the splitting of the Red Sea as much as the waters returning and drowning Paro and his horses. But I would ask you, what was miraculous at the splitting of the Red Sea? It's not the drowning of Paro. That's not miraculous at all. In other words, what happened was is the sea split. So now there's a space where there used to be water. The Jews walked through that space. Now Paro comes. As Paro was there, the miracle ends and the water reverts back to its normal position, and as a result, Pyro was drowned. So the drowning of Pyro was not miraculous at all. The drowning of Pyro and his men. That's perfectly natural. In other words, if the water has been removed, and Pyro goes into a place where there once was water, and now the miracle stops, and the water reverts back to its original position, of course, Pyro is going to be drowned. It's not <coughs> the drowning of power is miraculous. It's the splitting of the Red Sea in the first place that enables the Jews to cross. So if the Jews were singing a song of praise to God, we would think that the Azyashi should talk about the miracle of how the Jews crossed the sea. And it's an amazing thing that there's nothing in the Azyashi at all that makes reference to the miracle of the Jews being able to cross the sea. Nothing at all. Take the psukim, you'll see. It's all about sus v'roch v'abram v'ayam, how Paro and his horses were toppled, how they sunk into the depths, and so on and so forth. It was not miraculous at all. It, 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 it's really just the restoration of nature. It's the ending of the miracle. Now, there is one reference to the fact how the waters uh, stood like heaps. But if you look at the Pesukim carefully, it's really only coming to explain why Paro went into the Yam. It's the introduction to Paro's going in and the waters closing in on him. Now, the idea is like this, that Oz Yashir is not a song about a miracle. Oz Yashir is a song about nature. It's a song about the restoration of nature. And uh, it, it's an interesting thing. You see, we don't praise God for the natural phenomena. Why? Because we're accustomed to them. They don't make an impression upon us. You know, the, uh, the Gemara tells us that Adam Harishan, when he was born, was so filled with wonder, he was inspired to sing Shira. Mizmor Shir Liyom Shabbos. 
was the song that Adam Harishan composed that very first Shabbos. He was inspired to sing Shira. Now, we aren't. And when we're born, we don't sing Shira. Well, when we're born, we can't. We're babies, can't speak. By the time we're old enough to speak, everything is familiar. Uh, sunrises aren't surprising, sunsets aren't surprising, all the natural phenomena aren't surprising. Once in a while, you, you see something breathtaking, and all of a sudden, you go out of your mind. You go to Niagara Falls for the first time, right? <laughs> you see the power of the falls, you feel like bursting into soil. But the things that we see day in and day out are uh, not impressive. And the fact that things grow, it's a fantastic, it's a myth, things grow. You plant the seed and then something grows. Why is that more astounding or less astounding than Tchiyas Mesim? Tchiyas Mesim is the same thing. You plant a body in the ground, it decomposes, later on it sprouts. Why is that more amazing than planting a seed when things grow? Rav Dessler just points out, because this is familiar, that's not familiar. That's the only difference. But really, it's, it's, it's not any, any more of a wonder. So therefore, we don't sing praise. We don't sing praise for the natural order because it just doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't impress us. But when there is a suspension of the natural order, and even for a moment things are different, then when nature is restored, we notice it. We notice it. Um, And that's what Oz Yashir is about. Oz Yashir is not a song of miraculous intervention. Oz Yashir is a song about the restoration of the laws of nature. Right? We are astounded by it because we had a momentary intermission. There was a momentary lapse. And therefore, when nature is restored, it's something that makes its impression on us. And we're inspired to sing Shiva. Therefore, it's not a violation of the rule. Because we don't praise God for the miraculous interventions, that's Mechaira from the God. That, that implies that we don't have to praise God for the natural order. Here in the to the contrary, we are praising God for the natural order. Question? Um, <clears throat> can't get the Ron off my mind. If for the Jews, they, they perceived it, you know, as a natural phenomenon, then what they would sing about would be the destruction of their enemies. Not the spreading of the sea. It would actually be a, if you follow the Ron's logic, it makes sense that the song should be about the destruction of Ara, which was and his his palace guard, rather than about the what was a natural phenomenon. Yeah. See, even that put, put the Ron out of your mind. Even that is not a, not a clear thing. In other words, when we talk about the Azyashir, what are they singing about? Are they singing? Of, is it a song of, of victory, if you will, you know, because of the drowning of their enemies? Or is it really a song about God's divine power, which just happened to display itself in the drowning of their enemies? Because what is the emotion which leads them to Shira? Wonder or relief? Wonder. That's the question. I would like to think wonder, and I'll tell you why I'd like to think that. Because there's another question, another uh, issue over here. The Chazal tell us we have a rule, bin al tismach. We're not meant to rejoice at the downfall of our enemies. And uh, it's a very, very interesting thing. The, uh, the Mishnah Perkyava says that each of the Chacham had a, a motto, Hu Haya Omer. This is what he used to say. He used to say this, he used to say this. So there was a sage named Shmuel Akotan. So it says, Shmuel HaKotten HaYaimer, he used to say, B'nafayol HaYivach Al Tismach, don't rejoice, rejoice in the downfall of your enemies. Now this is a very perplexing thing, because this is really not an original statement. This is a verse from Mishlei. It's a verse from Proverbs. So he would often quote the verse. But like, what is the idea? Like, uh, okay, it's a verse. Whoever quoted it, it's, it's, it's a worthy lesson. But what is the Mishnah making the point that Shmuel HaKotten used to say it? Now the answer is like this. That the, the Farshim say when it says Hu Haya Aymar, 
this sage, he used to say this, he used to say this, he used to say this. It isn't just he used to say it. If he would say it, it was because this was a principle which he lived. It's not like nowadays, you know, you, you say things. People say things. In other words, I say things, you know. Do I live up to them? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe 30% of the time. Maybe sometimes a little better. But when these great sages said things, these were principles by which they lived. And Shmuel Cotton's life's principle was going to follow that al -Tismach. There was no joy in the downfall of his enemies, enemies of the Jewish people. You know, that, that great uh, German word, Schadenfreude. You know, it, it, it was not part of his personality. There was no celebration of people's downfall. Now, the interesting thing is that there's a Gemara that says in Masechus Brachas that the original Shmona Esrei had 18 blessings. And Rumgumliel, Hasheni, Rumgumliel, who was the head of the Sanhedrin in Yavda, ordained the 19th, which is called the Birch HaSaminim. This was a blessing where we pray for the downfall of the heretics, the slanderers, and the people who uh, corrupt the, the Jewish religion. So the Gemara says that when they wanted to ordain this Birch HaSaminim, they said, who, who is it appropriate? Who could ordain the wording for this blessing? So, Nasnu Enein Mishmuel HaKatna. Everyone turned to Shmuel HaKatna and they said, this person, <laughs> this person is fit to compose the Berch HaSaminim. So you learn the Gemara, and you don't keep that Mishnah Pirkei of in mind. You think that maybe he was uh, the most eloquent uh, writer, the best vocabulary, uh, uh, the, the most expressive language. So therefore, he was the one that could ordain the Birch HaSaminim. But uh, Rav Kuk Zeich Tzadik Levrach used to explain that, that if you're having a prayer that your enemy should have a downfall, you want the person that composes it to be the type of person who doesn't gloat. Mm -hmm. That he's not doing it because of personal animosity. He's doing it to uphold the honor of God. But there's no personal satisfaction in it. So the question is, who could ordain such a blessing? The only answer is Shmuel Akhatan. He's the only one. Why? Because he was well, Yaomer. He used to say, you know, follow that Everything he stood for. So even, that means even national enemies as opposed to personal enemies? You should... That's right. That's right. In other words, it, it has to be that you're totally like above if, above the, the, the like satisfaction. If the Arabs were wiped off the face of the earth, we wouldn't, we shouldn't be happy about it? it, it You'd be happy about it, but not happy in the sense that... <laughs> not expressive. Not that, expressive. No, 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 I don't mean that. That doesn't that say it. You shouldn't be happy because, uh, you know, this is something personal. You know, there's a Kiddush Hashem, you know, the world is a better place. But but it's not something that I take personal satisfaction in. Um, you know, the Netziv says an amazing thing. It's, it's a frightening <coughs> thing. As we know that Yaakov Avinu, he stole the brachas from Esau, he outwitted him, and he suffered consequences. So the Natsiv says that what was the, the reason for that? I mean, Yaakov was doing what he was supposed to do. His mother, Rivka, was in Nabiya, she was a prophetess. She decreed that he should do this. Why was he punished for it? Why did he suffer for it? And the Natsiv some, says something, I, I'd be scared to say it on my own. He says that Yaakov suffered for it because he took some satisfaction in Esau's downfall. He got the better of his, his brother. It was a personal satisfaction. And then Tzib says an amazingly deep thing. He says like this. Now there's a, there's a concept of a veiro lishma. An aveiro lishma. A sin which is done for the sake of heaven. That means like this. Something which normally is prohibited. But under certain circumstances is permitted. So it's called Naveira Lishma. It's Naveira, something which normally would be a Naveira, but you're doing it for the sake of heaven, meaning in a way that Allah permits. But it's just like this. When you do a mitzvah, something which is always a mitzvah, even if you don't do it with the most pure of intentions, it's a mitzvah. Okay? There are levels. You know, the, 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 the purer your kavana, the better. But uh, if the kavana is not 100% pure, it's also okay. When it comes to an Avera Lishma, a thing which is normally prohibited, but the Torah only permits under specific circumstances, then your intention has to be pure. If your intention is not pure, then it becomes sinful. 
because it's a thing which really should be a sin. The only justification is this is an exceptional case because Allah permits it for whatever reason. Here your intention has to be pure. If it's not pure, it's a sin. The Chavetz Chaim, for example, rules this way Allah Lamaisa. As we know, there's a prohibition of Moshe You're not allowed to slander a person. But we know there are certain situations where you're obligated to convey derogatory information. Let's say, for example, someone is going to enter a partnership and he's about to hire a person or a team with a person who's dishonest, he's an embezzler, you're obligated to tell him. You're obligated to tell the person because uh, <coughs> there's a prohibition of losam at all down. You're not allowed to stand idly by while a person is going to suffer harm or loss. But there are conditions. There are conditions. The Chavetz Chaim gives a list of conditions that has to be met to permit conveying this information. One is, there's no other way to prevent the harm or loss. If I can prevent it some other way, I can't prevent it by passing on the negative information. It has to be information I know firsthand. I can't exaggerate. Right? It has to be just the facts as they are. One of the conditions the Chavetz Chaim says is that I have to do it with pure intentions. If I really have some personal hatred of that person and I pass on the information and I take satisfaction in that, mm -hmm. it's prohibited. Now, again, so what are you going to do in that situation where the other person needs to know, but you find you can't? <laughs> well, let's say, for example, I'll give, I'll give you a theoretical example. Let's say uh, someone is about to send his kid to some other yeshiva, not my own. <laughs> right? And I know that there's some terrible dirt about that yeshiva, <laughs> right? And really, I have to tell them, because uh, otherwise the person is going to suffer irreparable harm sending his kid there. But on the other hand, there's self-interest, because after all, you know, if he doesn't go there, I'll go to my yeshiva, right? Chavz Chaim says he can't do it. He can't you do it. You let him go to that yeshiva. So I don't know. What's the answer? So what do you do? Mm -hmm. Chavz Chaim basically says you have to work on yourself, right? to purify your intentions yeah. so you can say to yourself with a certainty you are doing it totally for altruistic reasons. How exactly you do that, I don't know. Yeah. I, don't know the, I don't know who has that level of mind control to be able to put aside my own self-interest and say <clears throat> with a certainty, with a 100% clarity, I'm only doing it because <laughs> I want to prevent that person from suffering harm and I have no interest in it at all. You can send the message of God. I mean, you, you might do it this way. You might tell the guy, listen, this is, you know, your kid can't come to my yeshiva. Yeah. yeah. Just don't go to that one. <laughs> you know, maybe you can do that. But, but uh, it's almost an impossible um, threshold to, to cross. But this is the idea that the, uh, the Gemara says, it has to be totally, totally um, pure. So getting back to what we're talking about, which is... The reason for for so. Right, that the the benefoli uh, right? You know, it, it has to be totally, totally, totally pure. Because if there's anything personal to it, then it, it's it's tainted. So I would like to think that the azyoshir is not motivated by relief. It's not so much the satisfaction at the downfall of our enemies. It, 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 it's it's a wondrous thing the power of nature. By the way, when you think about it, it's Niagara Falls. What is so amazing about Niagara Falls? Nature. Niagara Falls is really um, not any more miraculous in terms of the science of it than when you pour a glass of water into the sink. Mm -hmm. Right? It's just, it's just gravity. That's all it is. Right? <laughs> Niagara Falls is not more miraculous than that. There's a cliff, and the water goes over the cliff, and it goes rushing down, and that's all it is. It's just gravity. So, you know, go home, take a glass of water, pour it into the sink. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not any more miraculous. It's not a different phenomenon. It's the same phenomenon. You save a lot of money, not traveling to Niagara Falls. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, but the point picture. is, yeah, yeah, when, when it's so much water, it isn't just a glass of water, it's a river of water, <laughs> right? And it comes down with thundering force, yeah. it, 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 it's more impressive. But it really is essentially the same thing. <laughs> but, but this is the idea. The idea is that, that um, you know, the Oziyashiv is it has to be pure, and it's it's an interesting thing that that you know, th there is this suspicion 
that maybe um, we are unable to do that. You know, the, uh, the, the, the Medrash says the reason we don't recite the entire Hallel on the last day of Pesach is because um, this is a, the Kriyas Yamsuf, and uh, perhaps we're guilty also of the following Vachal Tismach. So we don't celebrate that day to the extent that we should. Yet we do say the Oz Yashir every day. It would seem to me that that's the whole point of the Oz Yashir. The intentions of those who said it were so pure that when we say it, we're saying it with the same kavana. If there was any song of praise that we would um, say, even the conventional howl, isn't necessarily free from that, for that taint. I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult uh, <coughs> test to pass, but I think that's what we have to be uh, called upon to do. Before I conclude, let me just mention that, uh, as you may know, you may not know, um, we have a simcha of Ezez Hashem this coming week. Um, my daughter is getting married this Thursday. There will still be a shear Monday night. <laughs> the Sheva the Brachas train is uh, leaving town for two days, Monday and Tuesday. I'm not on it. It was an interesting thing. Someone told me a story about a guy. He's uh, a fellow. He's already his grandchildren married, many grandchildren married, and he said that he hasn't missed a single Sheva Brachas. Not of one of his children, not one of his grandchildren. You know, he married off all his children, all his grandchildren, he hasn't missed a single Sheva Brachas. I said to myself, why do I need that pressure? <laughs> right? I'm, I'm going to miss, I'm going to miss my first child, Sheva Brachas. This way I'm, I'm free, I'm off the hook. It's like you tell a story that uh, when the base of Levi became the Rav of Brisk. So, uh, he's the Rav. In those days, what was the job of a Rav was to answer Shilas, to answer questions of Jewish law. The first Shaila he got, whatever it was, they come and ask him a serious question. He thinks, says, I don't know. Really? It's pretty shocking. Then the second question came to him a little while later. He thinks about it. So I don't know. <laughs> and then a third question came, and he said, he says, I don't know. So anyway, the world got out that you know, the rabbi doesn't know anything. I mean, he doesn't answer questions. <laughs> so finally, uh, the, the heads of the community came, and they said, like, what's going on? So he says, I just want to explain to you that when I moved to Brisk, to become the, the rub of Brisk, I resolved in my mind that the first three Shilas that I'd be asked, I would say I don't know. Why? So, you know, imagine how it works. You, know, you get a Shiloh and you answer it, right? You answer your second Shiloh, your third Shiloh. I'm three for three, right? Next Shiloh comes, I'm four for four. Mm -hmm. I'm five for five, I'm on a roll. I have a perfect record. Every question comes my way, I'm answered. Then all of a sudden, you're asked a question which is a little difficult. And, 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 and you can't answer right away, and you really don't know the answer. But you have a perfect record that you're <laughs> trying to keep up. So you shoot from the hip and you give an answer, and it really isn't the correct answer. So why do you need pressure for? <laughs> right? So this way, I started my career 0 for 3. <laughs> so now I don't, have to, uh, I don't have to keep up a record. Right? Which is a, a very, uh, yeah, a very so smart way of doing it. Very sw <laughs> smart way of yeah. uh, doing it. But that was the, that was the, uh, that was the nice thing. So, um, so I said to myself the same thing. That, Listen, what am I going to do? You know, I, I'm going to have this pressure. You know, it's, it's, you know, look, our our son-in-law is from San Francisco, right? We're traveling. The last of Ruchas is in San Francisco. So we're traveling on Wednesday, Wednesday after the wedding. We have a flight 7 a.m. to San Francisco, and we're returning midnight, San Francisco time. We're at three o'clock in the morning. We're coming back next morning. Yeah, you, know, you can't. Uh, you know, you gotta. We gotta mind the store here. But so, but two days, Monday and Tuesday, we're not going. It's Muncie Lakewood. We're we're sticking. So Monday there will be a shear. But, but, and um, you know, with 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 you know, invitations to the Simchas, you know, it, it it has become such a such a. No, it, it, it was it, it was it was so nice in the olden days when people just on their own came to the simcha. So I'll tell you an amazing story. It was an amazing story that 
that there was a great rabbinic wedding. A great rabbinic wedding. Reb Chaim Brisker's son, Reb Maisha, married the daughter of Reb Elia Prusiner, who was the great Reb Prusian. This was the rabbinic wedding of the century in the late 1800s. It was like a big, big uh, affair. And you know, every row in Europe was, uh, was anybody was invited. Like this was the hottest ticket in town, but it, you know, they invited everybody. But there was a certain row, I won't mention who it was, even though I do know who it was, that Reb Chaim Brisker had some disagreements with. He held that the person was a little too radical in some of his uh, positions. So Reb Chaim told his mukhutin that they shouldn't invite him. We think should invite him because you know we 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 don't approve of everything he's done, so we, we can't invite him to the wedding. Anyway, he didn't get an invitation, but he says to himself, "How can it be that, that they didn't invite me to the to the wedding?" You know, he's a rogue. He says it must be I lost in the mail, <laughs> so I'm going to stand on ceremony. I'm coming anyway. <laughs> he comes to the wedding. He shows up. I'm invited. He shows up to the wedding. So Chaim told his mukhutin they should honor him with Cedar Kedush and he should perform the ceremony. Well, so because I don't understand. So you told me not to invite him, now you're telling me we should, we should honor him? So Reb Chaim says, oh, but it's far to God al-Hadar. <laughs> he's the greatest of the generation. So we have to honor him. You know, you don't invite him, you don't invite him, but if he's already here, <laughs> we have to uh, invite him. So, I, I, I beg you, please don't stand on ceremony, right? In other words, if you got an invitation, if you didn't get an invitation, please join us on Thursday. Thursday, the chuppah is, uh, the Kabbalah's part of the sixth, the chuppah is seven, you want to come afterward. Now, please join us, and uh, Hashem, we can uh, have a simcha. And um, hopefully we'll all have simchas. Amen. And uh, <coughs> I, I was, this past time was in Muncie for the offer of, right? And uh, so I decided that uh, I'm going to take my uh, son and my son in law to be. We'll take him to the square Rebbe, Mutsai Shabbos. Go for a bracha. Well, why not? You know, I'm, I have a little Hasidic blood in me. Go to the square Rebbe. So, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the square keeps Shabbos very late. You know, Shal Shudas is probably over at 10 o'clock at night, you know, even in the winter. You know, but we went at 11, right? And we got in right away. It was like almost like a, like a miracle. It was a whole room of waiting people, but uh, you know, from Toronto, so you know, we got kind of pushed ahead of the line. And and uh, the Rebbe gave gave me a bracha personally. He said, "You should never rest up from simchas. Mm -hmm. so you can rest up from other things, right? But never rest up from simchas." Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, I, I think we should all think that way. In other words, you know, uh, because I, I was thinking that way myself, you know, you're making a chasta, you know, uh, and all the details. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I said to someone, I said, you know, I can't wait to see it on the video. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I don't know if I can if I can survive till the real event, but, you know, when it's over, you know, then I'll be able to watch it on the video. But uh, this is what he said, but don't, you know, never rest up from Simcha. You rest up from hard work, you rest up from tsaras, but uh, from simchas you should never, never rest up. And it's uh, a good bracha. Hopefully, the bracha should be niskayin, should be filled for, for everyone. Everyone he is here, everyone who isn't here. Okay, as I said, but Monday night, in any case, we will be here. Okay.